Hello and welcome to this edition of Wineskins. I'm Father Jim Corda. Wineskins is a program that features reflections on the lives of the saints and the sacred scriptures, along with a variety of issues and topics, all from a Catholic perspective. Wineskins is brought to you through the annual Diocesan Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts, a division of the Society of St. Paul. On our program today, I will interview Sister Pat McNicholas in part two from our series Spotlight. We will also hear more information on St. Monica, and today, as the Church celebrates the 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time, we will get a deeper insight into those particular Sunday readings. That and more on Wineskins. Catholic Charities is an important part of the life of the Church and her members. To share with us an important issue is Olivia Wall. Joining me today is Olivia Wall, who is a communications assistant at Catholic Charities. Welcome to Wineskins. Hi, thank you. You know, Olivia, this is a, a new position for you and with Catholic Charities, and also in the area of communications. Why this whole area of communications in Catholic Charities? Why is that important? Well, I was raised Roman Catholic. Um, I grew up in Pennsylvania and was raised in the Catholic faith. So that's always something that's been important to me. But also my entire life giving back to people is something that has been really close to my heart. And when I came to Youngstown for school, I found that I was really passionate about communications and that that was also a way for me to be able to communicate to other people the needs of others in our community. So it's important to be able to show through my faith the way that I think giving back is an important thing. Let's talk about some of the actual things that you do in your job. Tell us about that. Well, one of my main responsibilities for Catholic Charities is running our social media accounts. So I've taken charge of our Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, with those, I've been creating content for others to broadcast our events and all of our ministries, like our prison ministries and things like that, to get the word out to other people so they know the services that we have available. Now, why is it important for us, I think, nowadays to use social media to really get the word out? Social media is a great way to be able to connect everybody, especially in a quick manner. And now as we're getting more younger people getting into the workforce too, I think it's a good way to get them involved so that they can find a way to give back as well. Is there any particular kind of like bent or goal that you have in reaching out in kind of advertising for Catholic Charities? Is there any particular group that you really want to target? My goal is to really get the younger audience involved. I think we have a strong community already of adults in our community that are supportive of Catholic Charities, but bringing our younger individuals, especially those in our Catholic schools as well, into our community more and keeping them involved after school is really important to me. Now, during the uh, summer months, we kind of tend to think that things slow down, and sometimes and in some respects they do, but the work and the needs of charity continue. What would you like to let the folks know that are with us about the needs of Catholic Charities? I think our needs actually increase over the summer. So for us, it's something where it's not a slowdown at all, because especially as kids are home, but parents are still needing to work, those who are in poverty and need are really in need of our resources over the summer because they don't have what they could normally get at school or at other places. So we really need others to be more giving over the summer months. Now, as you uh, do your posting on those different social media platforms, is there any uh, thing that you'd like to let the folks that are with us who may not be familiar with those platforms and how to get those messages? Yeah, everybody can find us on Facebook or Instagram and Twitter. Twitter, uh, you can Google Catholic Charities, Diocese um, Youngstown, and we should come up on all of those. And you can find our social media platforms. We're also on Instagram at CCDOY. I do have to say that I'm a follower of yours on Instagram. I do check those out every day. And what I like about them is it, it gives us kind of not only a sense of what Catholic Charities is all about, but kind of an up-to-date of what Catholic Charities is actually doing, what's going on in the community 
community and what is really happening in the life of Catholic Charities. In closing, what would you like to tell the folks that are with us about the work that you do for Catholic Charities, especially in communications? The work that I do, I think it's a great way for me to be able to connect with everybody in our community. And I'm really looking forward to be able to get my voice out there a little bit more and keep everybody connected. Well, Olivia Wall, Communications Assistant at Catholic Charities, we certainly appreciate your presence here on Wineskins, but we also thank you for the work that you do. We congratulate you as a graduate recently of Youngstown State University and also a recent hire here in the Diocese of Youngstown. We thank you for your youth, for your energy, and for the wonderful work that you do, especially in social media. Thank you for having me. For Wineskins, I'm Father Jim Corda. St. Monica was the mother of St. Augustine. To tell us more is Barb Zorn. She is from Holy Family Church in Poland. Is there anyone who doesn't know St. Monica? She is the patron saint of all mothers, as well as of married women, housewives, alcoholics, and those who are victims of infidelity. St. Monica is known today because she had a famous son. Indeed, the only things we know about Monica came from the writings of her son, St. Augustine, especially in his confessions. If it had not been for the prayers and perseverance of St. Monica, the Church would not have had the benefit of Augustine's wisdom. Considering the trials Monica faced, she could easily have become an unhappy wife a bitter daughter-in-law and a despairing mother. She is a saint because she did not give in to any of those temptations. Monica was born around the year 332 in North Africa, in what is today Algeria. Her parents were wealthy Christians who employed servants. One of the servants was an elderly woman who was put in charge of Monica and her sisters. Monica told Augustine, who reported it in his confessions, that she owed the discipline she learned not from her mother, but to this elderly maidservant who restrained them earnestly when necessary with a holy severity and taught them with a grave discretion. Monica eventually married and had three children, two boys and a girl. It was only Augustine who caused Monica so much pain He was the more brilliant of the two sons. Although this greatly upset Monica, she refused to let him eat or sleep in her house when he visited her. One day, while she was weeping about her problems, she had a vision. A figure appeared and asked her why she was crying. When she replied that she was weeping about her son, the figure told her to dry her tears because your son is with you. Later, she told Augustine about her vision. He said that there would be no problems between the two if Monica would give up her faith. Monica quickly replied, He did not say, I was with you. He said that you were with me. Eventually, Augustine was baptized by Ambrose on Holy Saturday of the year 387, along with his son. He then resolved to return to North Africa. In a conversation with her son, Monica said, Son, for my part, I have no further delight in anything in life. What I know now is that my hopes in this world are accomplished. One thing which I desired was to see you a Catholic Christian before I died. My God has done this for me more abundantly that I should now see you despising earthly happiness become his servant. Five days later, Monica fell sick with a fever. She died on the ninth day of her illness when she was 56 and Augustine 33. Augustine went on to be a priest at age 36 and then a bishop when he was 41. He continued as Bishop of Hippo for 35 years becoming the most influential ecclesial figure, not only of the fifth century, but for many centuries thereafter. The church celebrates St. Monica's feast on August 27th, the day before St. Augustine's feast. For Wineskins, I'm Barb Zorn. 
back to Spotlight. I'm talking with Sister Pat McNicholas about Beatitude House. You know, Sister Pat, one of the areas, probably a prominent area of outreach for the women and families that are part of Beatitude House is education. Why is education, and I know with the Ursuline sisters, that is really preeminent part of the charism. Why is that so important, not only for your community, but also for them? I think pretty much all of us know that the stepping stone out of poverty is education. And because now some of the families we serve suffer from pretty severe disabilities, including some mental health, we were finding that we weren't able to help them quite as much with especially post-secondary education. So four years ago, we started a new program called Beatitude House and Ursuline Sisters Scholars. And so it's a way to continue that that drive for education and what we're doing is enabling with support services low-income women to get the support they need so they don't drop out of school and last year we were so pleased that in spite of the pandemic in spite of the fact that they might have been trying to work and had their children at home 80% either graduated or remained in school. That, in spite of the statistic that the most likely person to drop out of post-secondary education is a single parent with children, you know? So these women did very well. We had 16 graduates, and we're targeting not just the colleges, but the community colleges and the career centers. So as a stepping stone, if somebody can get through an LPN degree, they can begin to get on their feet. Sure. And then if they can, they can move that up to an RN and a BSN. So it's a stepping stone and it gets them started. I'd like to go back to something I mentioned briefly in our first segment, and that is generational poverty. You know, a lot of people really are not familiar with that because they've just never either been around it or just are completely ignorant to it. But what is generational poverty and how has that impacted a lot of the people people that you serve. We believe that the theory of bridges out of poverty uh, and the sociological theory is very accurate in predicting that people who have families who have been in poverty for several generations find it harder and harder to break out because certain values have taken over in their lives and some of that is understandable when you really come to ponder it. They get forced into being in the present all the time. There's a crisis today. I'm always dealing with that crisis and therefore I have a very hard time anticipating a different future and planning for that future. And picture families we work with who have never had sick days at work, have never had a vacation day. Many have never been to a restaurant where you sit down and are served. So what's important to them? If they get a chance, a movie, television. And so so I've heard people sometimes complain, well, they're so poor, but they have a big TV. Yeah, they don't have a vacation. They don't have days off. They don't have travel. They don't have restaurants. A break from that pressure they live under is exemplified by that yeah. television. Why is it sometimes when we talk about generational poverty that, that people have almost this edge of uh, racial prejudice, which is part of it all, too, when you think about it? Why are we so prone to that. Why do we presume that people on welfare are African American exactly. when in fact the majority are Caucasian? Mm -hmm. And I remember seeing the statistic some time ago that half of the people on welfare live in Boardman, mm -hmm. Camel, the various suburbs. suburbs as well as the city but the concentration of the african-american community in the city contributes to that image that all the poor people are in the city where they're hidden in the other areas well you know it's wonderful that beatitude house has really reached out to people over these 30 years and there's a lot of as we had mentioned great success stories what is your particular role as a, the donor relations director what is it that you you do to engage people to understand better the mission and the ministry of Beatitude House and how can they help you? 
basically I talk on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we find that it's telling those stories, mm -hmm. meeting with people, sharing the story is mm -hmm. what helps people understand. And after the pandemic, we hope that we can invite donors to actually come this way I, and have a chance to meet one of the clients and somebody who has helped. And we celebrate an annual event called Cornerstones where we invite the donors mm -hmm. to come and meet with the families as we recognize the achievements of the women and children. And mm -hmm. if you want to sell the program, that sells it. Right. Let's go back briefly to the immigration, because nowadays there's many dioceses and many communities that really don't want to get involved in that aspect. Why is it important for us as, as a church, but also as a community, to be aware of the immigrants? And why is it important for us to reach out to them and to help them? I think we need to face the fact that a percentage of them are here legally. And so we put them all in one category of those people. Secondly, those trying to come into the country or who may have crossed out of desperation, we need to understand understand the situations in Central and South America that people are fleeing the kind of terrible mm -hmm. injustice and sometimes what our country has been part of contributing to that problem. And so we have young people with us who are now going to be able to apply for DACA who mm -hmm. came here as children. This is the world they know. And I talked to one mother who had a small business in Honduras, was being threatened, was being pressured to pay bribes, and then her daughter, they were threatening to take to rape and kill. Mm -hmm. And she took her fears and turned it into flight. Yeah. Well, that's something that Beatitude House addresses, and we're grateful in this community for that. Sir Pat, we're gonna have your development director with us in a moment, but we wanna thank you for the service and the many years that you've devoted to Beatitude House. In Sister Peggy's name, whose legacy continues, and we hope not only another 30 years, but well into our future. So thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. Very very much appreciated. For more pertinent information and to listen to Wineskins, visit www.doy.org, the website of the Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. Stay with us. We'll be back in a moment. Hi, I am Mary Jo Kubiak for Beatitude House. For 30 years, Beatitude House has adapted to meet the changing needs of disadvantaged women and children. Now more than ever, caring daily for over 200 people is challenging and takes a great deal of creativity. We are helping our little ones concerned with this bad germ deal with their fears. We're keeping our school-aged children engaged. Go to BeatitudeHouse.com and donate directly through our secure website. Church World Service believes that being self-reliant is a joy everyone should share. So around the block or around the world, share the joy. Our song today is from the CD called I Believe. It is by John Engadi. Life took a turn, came crumbling down I just couldn't seem to find solid ground My faith was broken, my spirit was weak I knew there was more than just what I seek Through the struggle, trying to survive You picked me up and you opened my eyes When I'm in doubt and lost my way All I can do is sit and pray Know that God is listening and hears me when I cry. I know I can't explain the reason why I'm alive. I know that I don't know enough on faith to I rely. I believe because I've seen the rainbow 
your promise in the sky I believe because of faith hope and love I believe Yes, I believe. I believe because you loved me. I believe because you saw me through. I believe because all I can do I believe is trust that you are by my side. I believe, I believe because your suffering. As we celebrate this 21st Sunday in Ordinary Time, we will hear more about the Sacred Scriptures by Deacon Ed Laubacher. He is from St. Paul Church in North Canton. Who is in and who is out? Who made the team and who got cut? Which candidate got the job and who interviewed for absolutely nothing? Which company was awarded the contract and who was rejected? Throughout our lives, we will feel like winners and at times feel like losers. We will make the team, make the grade, get the contract or the job, or not quite make the cut. In many youth sporting events, the trend has been that every kid gets a trophy, but that is certainly not what happens in the real world or in the real heaven. Not everyone who participates in life on this earth will be awarded salvation with our Savior. That is a pretty sobering thought. What do we have to do? Several years ago, I would often visit with a woman in a nursing home who was over 95 years old. She was an individual of incredible faith and was also an Army veteran. I remember her telling me the only reason the good Lord was keeping her alive was because the very large retirement pension she received each month, she mostly gave it away to various missions charities, or others who were in need. She was also an incredible witness for the faith, telling others about her Lord and what He had done not only for her, but for all of us. However, the one issue we discussed too often is that she often questioned whether she had done enough to make it into heaven. What does that mean? What does that look like? Surely it is different for each one of us as we have different gifts, different levels of talent, differing amounts of faith. I remember someone telling me that if she did not make it into heaven, into the giant table with our Lord, then the rest of us had no chance whatsoever. So what do we have to do? Clearly, simply hanging out with Jesus, simply knowing who Jesus Christ is, is not adequate. In our gospel, a group ate with him, he taught in their streets, they clearly thought they were the in crowd. But Jesus states that he did not know them. 
and they did not know Jesus very well either. Maybe simply going to church is not enough. Perhaps wearing a cross is not adequate either. What if we say a blessing before we eat, or a prayer before our next test or interview? Is this enough? I believe the operative phrase in this gospel is Jesus telling us, I never knew you. Our Savior clearly desires a personal relationship with us. He expects us to recognize Him as our Savior. He expects us to realize that we need a Savior. He also expects us to love Him in all the people in the world who are hurting. He expects us to see Him in every person, to realize that God who created each person is also inside them and is waiting to be recognized, waiting to be revealed. But it is not about doing enough as my old friend had questioned. We must first recognize that knowing our Lord as our Savior, recognizing it is through Him that all are saved, that our sins are washed away, is the beginning. Our response to this incredible blessing, this blessing of having a Savior who is for us, who desires us to be with Him, is what we then do on this earth for others. The manner in which we live our lives is how we tell others about our Lord and our God. We not only must talk the talk, but must also walk the walk and follow the path that He leads us. We must spend time in prayer and meditation so that we know who this Jesus is in our lives. We must spend time with Him in prayer as well as seeing Him in the beauty and dignity of every person. Lord Jesus, help us to recognize you in every individual today and to praise your divine majesty. For Wineskins, I'm Deacon Ed Lawbacher. Life has its seasons. In the moment of life that we are currently in, take stock of your situation. How much do you value following Jesus? Wineskins is a production of the Roman Catholic Diocese of Youngstown. It is brought to you by the Annual Diocesan Appeal, the Catholic Communication Campaign, and St. Paul's Catholic Books and Gifts. I'm your host, Father Jim Corda, wishing you a beautiful week. What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. It looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. They say America is the land of opportunity, but for some, life isn't so easy. Right now in America, one in six children lives below the poverty line. That's nearly 13 million children of all races all across our country. Where do you draw the line and get involved? You can make a difference in more ways than you think. Go to povertyusa.org today, because one in six children in poverty is one too many. A message from the Catholic Campaign for Human Development.